Thoughts on Fantasy Flight games? That's the question. That's the checklist we're going to build in this vlog. And I was recently asked when I was exploring this idea, I have three tiers in my board gaming collection, or perhaps think of it as three piles. Pile one are games that I play all the time, weekly, monthly. They never even make it to the shelf. Pile two are games that I enjoy, I really love, but they require the alignment of certain situations. Twilight Imperium, Descent First Edition, Kingdom Death Monster, they require a commitment. You have to get together with a group and say, hey, this weekend, who's up for TI? It's, it's not impossible, but it's not something that you generally bring to the gaming club. And then tier three are games that I love. I love the IP. I love the narrative. But there's crossover in other areas. Perfect example, Space Hulk. I, I love Warhammer 40,000. But I get a lot of 40K playing 40K. So I don't always jump over to Space Hulk as much as I should because when I'm not playing 40K, then I feel like I should play some other board games in my collection. But if I look at the titles, yes, there are some indie titles in there. There's a couple of really well-done hidden gems. But Fantasy Flight occupies a large percentage of my collection, whether it's titles that they have acquired the license for, Talisman, using that as an example, Twilight Imperium, or games that they've developed themselves, the entire line of Terranoth, where we see with Descent, we see with Runebound, one of my favorite top five board games, both second edition and third edition. I, I love them both for what they bring literally to the table. So from that perspective, I do have a lot of Fantasy Flight titles. And I was asked, well, Fritz, what do you think of Fantasy Flight? And I would turn that over to you guys. What do you think about Fantasy Flight? Now, I've seen more and more, whether it's through the merger, through the acquisition, or maybe it's just the natural life cycle as they develop from an independent company to being acquired and growing bigger and bigger and bigger. I, I see that it's, it's polaroid, polarized a lot. Certainly, it's not the Fantasy Flight of 10 years ago. It's definitely not the fantasy flight of five years ago, but that leads to the question, what about the future? Now, certainly what I really like is the fact that they have a number of licensed games, Lord of the Rings, the living card game, the duality of I'm glad I got involved in it, but at the same time, collectible card games, they are expensive, um, even when you acquire them at your own pace. But that journey into Middle Earth, I love it. You know, the fact on the opposite end, it's a miniatures-based game, but the fact that you can explore Star Wars, whether it at the time was X-Wing miniatures or looking at Legion and other aspects, I like the idea that, that popular titles, worlds that are well-established, they do decent production, decent rules, and you know you're going to have a good time playing it. So I look forward to when they acquire certain licenses. Yet at the same time, I enjoyed Terranoth. I found it to be a little bit generic fantasy with some specific points mixed in. I mean, we got proper cat folk with it, so really you don't see that much out of Skyrim. But in terms of Terranoth, I found that it was well-developed enough that I could feel like I'm part of a world, but not so insanely detailed that it took away from the game. And I enjoyed um, the fact that you had Runebound. I enjoyed that you had battle lore and the various titles as they went through, Descent. Now, it seems like they've been focusing more since they've been acquired to licensing, pumping out well-known titles that have an established IP like Lord of the Rings. A lot of their home stuff, they're cutting back. I mean, there's a lot still on the website. There's a lot still out there in the wild, but it's very, very obvious that they're going to pare it down to maybe just core. You know, the I call it Descent 3rd Edition. The new Descent, because it's well-known and they need to control that. It's interesting, the one thing that they have continued to do has been to innovate. I, I have to give Fantasy Flight the fact that they are willing to innovate and they are willing to take a risk. And most of the time, that innovation has paid off. Okay, a couple of examples. Runebound 2nd Edition was a pretty tight rule set. You had custom dice for terrain. You'd cast the dice out. You'd see what terrain symbols you got. And you'd move your figure. Combat was very straightforward. D10 based. You have to beat a certain number. And you can add attributes and magic items and, and cards. When they made the jump from second to third, and, and we see this with every edition that 
they jump, they keep what works or what was good enough that added the flavor, but then they innovate or they, they twist something, they change something. So we saw combat in Runebound as a perfect example of taking it and now casting these runes, these cardboard tokens with symbols. When you buy magic items, you get them, you cast them out, you interpret it, you do the damage, you do the effects. It takes a little bit more. Sometimes you get a little bit enthusiastic and the cardboard token flies off the table, but I like it. I like the innovation. We also see using Descent 1st Edition versus 2nd Edition. Descent 1st Edition was groundbreaking. It's amazing, still is, with with many aspects of it. And this is in effect since, what, 2008? Somewhere, Somewhere around there. It was a long game, though. I mean, it was the type of game like TI, Twilight Imperium, you brought out and you played on on a weekend. And I have many fond memories of Descent Marathons. Second edition realized, hey, we tighten up the rules a little bit. They're good to go. But the biggest challenge is the fact that these scenarios are so massive and the dungeon layouts are so massive. What if we cut them down into bite-sized? and specifically write them and tactically change them while keeping the overlord flavor, absolutely the overlord overlord flavor, keeping that so that as a player, I could sit down and play one or two adventures at the gaming club. I would regularly bring and still do Descent 2nd Edition. We play for an hour and a half, two hours, get that, get that, that feel, right? Get that spice. But also you could string them together and, and turn it into a weekend adventure where Descent first edition, based on the setup and everything, you really could not pause the play. I liked that innovation. Now, that innovation has has changed and grown to look at this idea that they are actively embracing app-based support. Um, Mansions of Madness, we see Descent third, we see with um, Lord of the Rings Journeys. More and more, Fantasy Flight is making a statement and saying, we're going app based. So we're we're fusing, we're merging the fact of digital and analog. Now, whether that's a good thing, whether that appeals to you, that's that's a vlog for another time. And we've we've explored some of that on my board gaming playlist. But what I hope Fantasy Flight doesn't lose, but I'm afraid they are because they're part of a bigger, bigger gaming system company and they have to report to shareholders. Taking innovation, um, a perfect example, legacy of Dragonhold. This idea of the Oracle system, this idea of a role-playing-esque game, story-based game. Yes, it's it's a huge, huge choose-your-own-adventure, but it's a lot more refined and slicker than that in that the game itself tracks internal time, tracks meetings. So in the – without giving away any spoilers, you could visit a shop, and if it's the morning time, certain characters will be there. If it's the afternoon, certain characters will be there. If you've interacted with a character at one part of the story module, it'll influence and open up in another part. So it's not just a decision tree where you branch out, but it's also has this feeling of very much a living universe. And what I found interesting is the fact that it is not dice-based combat or random-based combat. It's based on skills and interaction. I find that to be a very clever system because that with the token that gets passed around, everyone has a voice at the table. Everyone has a say, and you have to collaborate. You just can't – this is no D&D baby cakes where you just power through D20 or, or get an assist to get an advantage and take an auto 20. You have to really actively work. So this, this game and production value was fantastic. Literally going into a whole universe, it was very innovative. It was amazing. It still is. Now they produced it once and clearly – Things are being taken in a different direction. Another example, Warhammer Quest, the card game. I mean, that was a fantastic card-based dungeon crawler. And when GW pulled the license, yes, it did get reskinned into Terranoth. It is still amazing. But there are certain innovations, just just those two games. You know, not even going back to their uh, catalog of older games. Just those two games showed me that they have a team of designers that's like, you know what? Look, we got to make money. Absolutely. Everyone needs to get paid and we want to put out an amazing product, but let's do something different. Let's innovate. That experimentation, I think they've lost just by going full corporate and reporting to various shareholders. 
they have to go with what works, and, and that's licensing and perhaps distinguishing them through app-based. I like their products. I enjoy their game. They are much more hit than miss, and given some of the other publishers out there, if I feel like I have to take a gamble, you know, I've watched the videos, I've gotten some feedback, I've gotten some great recommendations from you guys, and you're like, Fritz, this, this Fantasy Flight title is good, it's solid. If I still feel like I'm on the fence and I acquire it due to poor impulse control, I'm less likely to be disappointed. There, there are a few titles that I've been disappointed on, and the majority of them have not been Fantasy Flight. 